Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the U.S. Copyright Office's Copyright Matters event, Create an Adventure with Copyright. And now, the Register of Copyrights and the Director of the U.S. Copyright Office, Karen A. Temple. Thank you. Good morning. And welcome to the United States Copyright Office Matters event on adventure. Today we have a really exciting program that is the brainchild of our Associate uh, Register of Copyrights, Katie Rowland. Uh, and I know that you will really appreciate this unique and exciting take on the aspects of copyright and adventure. We have several people who are immersed in adventure every day and whose work is intertwined, intertwined with copyright. But before we get started, we would like to show a short clip of some of the adventures that the Copyright Office staff have themselves taken um, throughout their years. And this, it starts with me, if you can see. Um, that's me on that one. And I will now let you see and see if you can identify various copyright staff throughout this. Right. Um, good morning. I am Katie Rowland, Associate Register of Copyrights and the Director of Public Information and Education here at the Copyright Office. And today we're going to do something very exciting. We're talking about adventure and copyright. And you saw before just a few of the clips of people and where they went all over the country, the world and the country. But behind me is a map and that shows even some more places that the Copyright Office has been, taking a little bit of the Copyright Office all over the place. Everywhere from far away to right across the street. What is really interesting about adventure and copyright is when I mention it, sometimes people ask, what do they have in common? But when you think about it, they really go hand in hand. Because when you think about a picture of a Caribbean or a beach in St. Thomas or Puerto Rico, and it inspires you to take a trip there. You go there and then copyright joins you on that journey. You have a book you read at the beach, you hear the sound of a steel drum in a tropical location, Those are, and you have a guidebook that shows you where to go. And then when you come back, you might have been inspired to create your own copyrighted work. So you may have made your own poem about a secret garden or a song about the friends you met around, along the way. So copyright is entwined with all of those things. One of the great things about copyright is that it really inspires us to do new things as well as travel. And as Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. So it's always great to go out and have your own adventure. One of the things that's the special, the special um, relationship between copyright and adventure is the act of creating itself. So when you are drawing a picture, 
making a song, in your mind, you have the beginning of that and you take a journey to make your final product, your creative work. And that part is the journey kind of within. And as George Eliot mentioned, adventure is not outside, but it is within. And Norman Rockwell follows up on that very nicely, saying that the secret to many artists living so long is that every painting is a new adventure. So you see, they're always looking ahead to something new and exciting. And to talk about that today, we've got some really exciting presenters. We have Jean Fink from the National Geographic. She's going to talk to us about how copyright plays a role in her work and all the exciting things that happen at the National Geographic. Then we are going to have Andrea Sachs, travel writer at the Washington Post, who will talk about her travels. And then we will have the library's own John Hessler, who is going to talk about how he was inspired by a book to go and chart the course around the world. And then finally, we have a musical performer, Shodake, who's going to talk about how his travels worked together with him and brought him to a new place with his music. And with that, I want to welcome Jalen Johnson, attorney attorney advisor at the Copyright Office to be your guide on this journey. So Jalen. Thank you, Katie. And thank you to all of us for joining us. Thank you to all of you for joining us as we explore the relationship between copyright and adventure. While copyright might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think of adventure, and adventure might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think of copyright, it's likely that you've somehow connected the two. If you've ever taken a trip after viewing a book, a song, hearing a song, or, or seeing a photo, then you've made that connection. If you've ever taken a picture, after you've gone on a trip, then you've made that connection. As you heard earlier, copyright office staff members submitted the photos that were shown on the um, display that, that was showing as you entered the room. And each photographer owns the copyright in their photos. They generously granted us permission to use them here today, so thank you all. Throughout today's program, we'll discuss examples of adventure-related creative works, and we'll also be doing a little bit of testing of your knowledge of some copyright-related creative works. Which brings us to our first activity, adventure quiz. And so this is a photo of a place in the world. And um, by show of hands, who can tell us where this place is located? Is it the, if you, I think it's A, raise your hand. Grand Canyon in Arizona? No hands. Is it the Red Cliffs Desert in Utah? Is it the Wave in Arizona? Or is it Nuba Mountain in Sudan? All right, well those of you who thought it was the Wave, you're right. So the wave is a perfect example of how a photo has the power to inspire a trip. This amazing rock formation in northern Arizona was relatively unknown until 2009 when Microsoft introduced it as a desktop wallpaper. Since that time, tourism to the wave has increased so much that the Bureau of Land Management limited access to the site to 20 people per day, and during peak seasons, Thousands of people apply for those 20 spots. Adventure and the movies also go hand in hand. Some big screen adventure movies are wild and fictional creations from the minds of their producers, such as Jumanji, Avengers, and the Star Wars series. Others, while wild and fictional, they may be inspired by history. Think about movies such as the Indiana Jones series, inspired by the quest for the Holy Grail, or Pirates of the Caribbean, inspired by pirates plundering British ships in the 1700s. Music too inspires and is inspired by adventure. John Denver often sang about his adventures in Colorado, as did Elvis Presley about Las Vegas and Bob Marley about Jamaica. The Beach Boys sang about their adventures in California. 
And it's probably likely that Miley Cyrus inspired many young adventurers to hop off a plane in LAX with a dream and a cardigan in search of the Hollywood sign and a party in the USA. Some songs also inspire long distance journeys. Think about Get Your Kicks on Route 66, written by songwriter Bobby Troop. America, written by Paul Simon, and I've Been Everywhere, written by Australian songwriter Jeff Mack. Mack wrote the original version of that song based on places that he visited in Australia. He actually visited all of the places except for one, Birdsville in Queensland. Mack's publishing company encouraged him to write about places in North America, and he did so using an, alma, uh, using an atlas and looking at places there. The American version then went on to be a big hit and was registered in the Copyright Office, like lots of adventure-related songs and creative works. But that doesn't mean that the Australian version went without notice. That version inspired Englishman Peter Harris to visit every single place in that song, which according to his blog took him close to three years and 30,000 kilometers. And he ended his trip in the one place that the, sing that the songwriter wasn't able to visit. That's Birdsland, Birdsville in Queensland. So these are just a few of the examples of the many ways in which copyright and adventure are created, are, are connected. So our, our presenters today will share with you more personal and professional ex experiences, which brings us to our first presenter, Jean Fink from the National Geographic. Many may be familiar with the National Geographic Society, which has taken us around the world to cities, jungles, glaciers, deserts, you name it. Through their magazine, website, philanthropic efforts, and museum here in Washington, DC, the Society has shown us the Titanic 12,500 feet under the sea, taught us about penguins in Antarctica, and drawn our attention to the plight of refugee camps in Afghanistan with the famous Afghan girl cover photo. Their archive and historical library contain nearly 12 million images, 800,000 hours of footage, and over 6 million pieces of paper. Jean oversees the Society's trademark and copyright portfolios in these archives. She manages the rights and clearance process for the Society's creative assets, and she's worked at the National Geographic Society for more than 30 years. She's currently the Vice President and Associate General Counsel. Jean will share with you what National Geographic Society does best, which is amazing images. Please join me in welcoming Jean Fink. Good morning, as, and thank you, Jalen, for that lovely introduction. Again, my name is Jean Fink, and I am one of the attorneys for the National Geographic Society. National Geographic is one of the world's largest nonprofit organizations and has been in existence for over 31 years. The photographs you saw in the opening montage are representative of what we are known for. I've spent 31 years of my career at National Geographic. Our mission has changed over the years. We started by inspiring and educating the armchair traveler about the world. Now our mission is moving toward a planet in balance and that is central to all of our initiatives. Photographs and great storytelling are the tools of our trade. I've learned that National Geographic is synonymous with adventure, excitement, and wonder. And my legal career has been packed with just those same things around the contracts for our work. One day a team is going to Everest, the next, we are headed to Russia's Arctic Circle to document the wildlife that live there. And then next, there's an expedition traveling down the Ganges River in India to trace the source of plastic products that end up in our oceans. I would like to first start with one of my legal adventures. David and Carol Hughes were famed documentary producers and spent time documenting the life of the honey badger in 1999. David and Carol held copyright to the footage and National Geographic had copyright to the resulting documentary, which we edited, added a music soundtrack, which included the National Geographic theme, another copyrighted element, an enterprising narrator, 
decided to extol the virtues of the honey badger in a satirical parody format. The quality of the clip is not the best because it is a couple of generations away from the original. However, that fact does not dim diminish the copyright in the new narration and edited footage. Note the National Geographic logo is in the upper left-hand corner. Oh, the honey badgers are just crazy. The honey badger has been referred to by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most fearless animal in all of the animal kingdom. It really doesn't give a shit. If it's hungry, it's hungry. Ew, what's that in its mouth? Oh, it's got a cobra? Oh, it runs backwards? Now watch this. Look, a snake's up in the tree. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. Whenever it's hungry, it just, ew, and it eats snakes? Oh my god, watch it dig. Look at that digging. The honey badger is really pretty bad at they have no regard for any other animal whatsoever. Look, and it's just grunting and, ew, eating snakes. Ew, what's that, a mouse? Oh, that's nasty. Oh, they're so nasty. Oh, look, it's chasing things and eating them. The honey badgers have a fairly long body, but a distinctly thick set, broad shoulders, and, you know, their, their skin is loose, allowing them to move about freely. And they twist around. Now, look, here's a house full of bees. You think the honey badger cares? It doesn't give a sh**. <laughs> this clip went live in 2012 and immediately went viral on YouTube. The parody has had 15, 52 million views to date. I say to date because National Geographic chose not to have the video taken down because I determined that it was a parody and we would potentially lose in any sort of legal challenge. Plus, it's hilarious and it raises <laughs> the, the profile of the natural world through humor. However, this story does have a happy ending for National Geographic because parodies do have limitations in terms of copyright. Randall, the enterprising narrator, decided he had a gold mine on his hands with his catchphrase, honey badger don't care. He entered into several merchandise distribution agreements using his catchphrase, but not all was not smooth sailing. A couple of years ago, National Geographic received a subpoena from one of the distributors who was in litigation with Randall, and the distributor was asking for a copy of National Geographic's footage license with Randall. I happily replied that there was no such license. Note to other potential parody creators. If Randall wanted to do more with his catchphrase, he should have gotten permission to use the footage. So, karma in action. <laughs> Adventures can happen anywhere. This adorable picture was posted to National Geographic's Your Shot website. With Your Shot, National Geographic began encouraging the amateur photographic community to share their copyrightable work. National Geographic would curate the submissions and post the best on its platforms. The photo of this squirrel crashing its way into the photograph of the couple posing in the background also went viral across the web. Melissa Brantz and her husband were hiking in Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada, and decided to take a portrait of themselves with the spectacular Lake Minnewanka in the background. The story goes that Melissa set up the camera's timer and went back to pose. Meanwhile, Attracted by the clicking timer, a Colombian ground squirrel, common in the park, popped up to investigate. Click! Self-portrait with ground squirrel was born. The squirrel did not sign a release for the use of his image. Animals aren't required to. But it will be forever immortalized in Brandt's copyrighted image. Some of the greatest adventures and copyrightable material begin with and are inspired by the beauty in our national parks. National Geographic had a hand in the creation of the national park system. Stephen Mather was chosen to lead the new government agency and he became known as the father of the National Park Service. First, however, he needed to stimulate popular interest in the parks, which might then lead to necessary congressional funding for setting up a new bureaucracy. Thus, in 1915, he arranged for a two-week pack trip into the Sierra Nevada in California and invited influential writers, reporters, and businessmen to see firsthand the great beauty of Sequoia National Park and the surrounding areas. The Mather Mountain Party included Gilbert H. Grosvenor, pictured here, 
the editor of the influential National Geographic magazine, who, enthralled, who was enthralled by everything he saw and became one of Mather's staunchest supporters. In a way, this trip became the foundation on which the society really began its long-standing relationship with the national parks. Grosvenor was quick to act on his support of the idea. He devoted the contents of the entire April 1916 National Geographic, called it Land of the Best issue, to Mer America's scenic wonders, encouraging his fellow citizens to appreciate their parks and to support an agency to run them. Every congressman received a copy of, 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 while the legislation to create a park service was pending. Grosvenor even helped draft the legislation wording and lobbied for its passage. The bill establishing the National Park Service was passed in 1916. The July 1906 issue featured 74 wildlife photographs made by George Shearis III, inaugurating the magazine's long relationship with wildlife photography. For clarity, Shearis didn't refer to himself as the third, but as three. Grobner will recall that it's one of the pioneering achievements of the National Geographic. It was an extraordinarily educative series. No one had ever seen pictures like this of wild animals. He could not exaggerate the enthusiasm with which they were received by the members. The popularity of this issue is such that even two years later, in 1908, it is reprinted to satisfy the clamor for copies, one of the only two issues known to have been reprinted at that time. The July 1906 issue is thus one of the most significant numbers in the magazines ever published. Not only does it arouse, in Grosvenor's phrase, a tremendous interest in national his natural history, it also inaugurates the magazine's long and renowned association with wildlife photography. Shearis retained copyright to his wildlife images, but shared this content with the world through publication. Shearis found himself mentioned in an Ernest Hemingway story, Homage to Switzerland, another copyrighted work. The relevant section is shown here. The magazine is mentioned on line three, and Shearis's name, George Shearis III, is highlighted at line seven and toward the bottom with his non-traditional suffix. Mount Everest. National Geographic has had a long history with this particular location. In 1963, Barry Bishop, a National Geographic staff member, along with five other Americans, summited Everest. He is pictured on the climb in this National Geographic copyrighted image. Before Bishop summited Everest, he also spent this winter of 1960 to 61 and was a guinea pig for phys physiology research. Doctors were studying the long-term effect of spending a significant amount of time in a lower oxygen setting. The first National Geographic special, Americans on Everest, emphasizes that motion pictures can complement still photography in bringing the world to a broad audience and also includes many copyrightable elements, the National Geographic theme, the footage, and the narration. Summit of the world, a world above the world, high, savage, frozen. The mountain is huge, and man is small, but man is here, man the seeker, the challenger. These will be the first Americans to climb the greatest of mountains. the Society mounted the largest science expedition of 40 members to Mount Everest to study all aspects of the mountain, from the flora and fauna to recording glacier positions and using LIDAR radar to map the mountain in 3D. 
members of the team are, are pictured here in their characteristic National Geographic yellow. One of the most impressive achievements was deploying five weather stations with one only 400 feet from the summit, and that one is also pictured here. In Washington, D.C., we expect to have a current and correct weather forecast. The weather stations make an accurate forecast a possibility when hundreds are trying to complete their ascent of Everest. This alone would be a huge step forward for all these climbers. In the image to the right, note all the tents. Everest has gone from a single expedition of 1963 to hundreds of climbers in a season. Base camp now covers two miles on the mountain. After 131 years, National Geographic is still exploring, still funding important work via its grant programs. We've given well over 13,000 grants and bringing the world to the readers of the magazine, viewers of the channel, and visitors to the .org and .com websites. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. As you saw in Jean's presentation, some of our favorite adventures, whether fact or fiction, are captured in film. So now it's time for another adventure quiz. Let's see who can name that adventure movie location. In Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jones finds himself on an adventure searching for the Ark of the Covenant in what African country? By show of hands, is it A, Egypt, B, Kenya, C, Tanzania, D, Zambia? Well, the few uncertain hands who said <laughs> A, Egypt, you were you're correct. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> so we have one more. Um, in the book, which was later adapted to film, Eat, Pray, Love, Elizabeth Gilbert visits all of the following countries except for which one in her journey to find uh, self-discovery? Is it A, Italy? Show of hands again. B, India? C, France? D, Indonesia. Okay, this was a much more confident and correct, again, answer. <laughs> the answer is um, C, France. So travel adventures are as popular as ever right now, thanks in part to creative works. Cheryl Strade's book, Wild, From Lost to Found on the Pacific Crest Trail, describes her 1,100-mile hike of the trail which goes the entire way from Mexico to Canada, traveling through California, Oregon, and Washington. Since the book's release in 2012, trail use has increased dramatically. According to the Pacific Crest Trail Association's website, they issued 1,879 long-distance permits to hike the trail in 2013. That number rose dramatically to 7,313 permits in 2018, nearly doubling between 2014 and 2015 after the movie adaptation of the book was released. The association now limits the number of long distance hikers that can begin in the Mexican border to 50 per day to help preserve the fragile desert resources. And books aren't the only way that adventurers document travel. Many hikers, backpackers, adventure junkies, and even just occasional travelers write blogs. An online search of the term travel blogs produced 4.8 billion hits. These blogs cover many topics, such as traveling solo, backpacking, traveling on a budget, traveling to historical places, traveling to find the best food, you name it. Bloggers include full-time nomads, weekend travelers, and professional travel journalists. If you think about it, travel journalism has been around as long as the written word, when early explorers would come back telling tales of new places. While in prison together, Rustichello de Pisa recorded Marco Polo's stories of travel throughout Asia between 1271 and 1295. 
and wrote his manuscript, The Travels of Marco Polo. Much more recently, in today's times, magazines such as Travel and Leisure and Condé Nast Traveler and newspapers such as the Washington Post inspire readers to explore the world. Our next speaker, Andrea Sachs, is a travel reporter for the Washington Post. Since 2000, Andrea has reported on nearby places such as Ellicott City, Maryland, and the Jersey Shore, and from far away locations, including Namibia and Russia. She contributes to the Post online discussion titled Talk About Travel. And recently, she's written articles on DIY dining adventures in Sweden, the best souvenirs to bring home from 10 countries, and new travel requirements for Americans traveling to New Zealand. Andrea's won many awards and honors from the Society for Features Journalism, Society of American Travel Writers, and Society of Travel Writers Foundation. Andrea will share with us how songs, books, and creative works have inspired some of her story ideas and how she's given a voice to that inspiration. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Sachs. Let me make sure I get the button right, though. Is that my first one? Hello, everyone. Oh, there she is. Hello, my name is Andrea Sachs, and um, I am a travel writer with the Washington Post. But you might recognize my name by someone else's use it, which is Anne Hathaway. And she played Andrea Sachs in Devil Wears Prada. She, went, she was a journalist, and she went to Northwestern, which is very similar to my life. And my feeling is if I copyrighted my name, I would be wearing Prada. But alas, I am wearing consignment from North Carolina. So a lot of people ask me as a travel writer, most common question would be, what are your favorite destinations? Happy to answer that after the event. One of the other ones is, where do we get story ideas? And so let me just find the button here. Did I do that right? Oh, yeah, so one of the ways, so I'll just most commonly would be news items. So for example, I was in Colombia recently because FARC, with the peace accord with the government, FARC, which is a rebel organization, a rebel group, had freed up jungles and mountains that were off limits to tourists, so now it's open for tourism, so I went to explore that. Another example would be ages ago, I was reading an article, I don't even remember what it was, but there was one line about how New York City was taking its old subway cars and dumping it south in New Jersey, in the waters of New Jersey. So I decided to go scuba diving to look at the subway cars, which became an artificial reef. So news is one way we get story ideas. Second would be my editor. She assigns me stuff. And so, for example, she told me to write a story on packing, which is ridiculous because I'm the worst packer. So I took a little pack at 2 in the morning. I'll throw clothes in a bag, not look at the weather report, and then land and realize I totally packed wrong. And then another time, she just put me on a ship, and I crossed the Atlantic and ended up in Southampton, England. So those are two ways that we get story ideas. Third way would be copyrighted material, which I didn't really think about until I was presented with this offer to attend. And I came up with a long list, and so I'm going to provide a short list, because I only have 12 minutes now. So I'm going to start with one of my favorite museums. This is in Cape Cod, and it's the Edward Gorey's house. And I'm a big fan of his macabre sense of humor. He used to live here, and when you enter the museum, you see sketches and drawings from when he was little. You see some of the designs that he made for Dracula when it was on Broadway, and he made enough money to buy this house. And one of my favorite attractions in the museum is, I don't know if you know the Gashley Crumb Tinies, the A through Z, so it's alphabet by killing children. So you have A is for Amy, who fell down the stairs, B is for Basil, assaulted by bears, and you go throughout the house and you find all these children. And so I took a picture of that to you, if you can see, I think her name is Ura. Um, and she's falling down the drain. Do you see that little girl falling down the drain? There she goes. And for this, at the end, if you find all of them, you win a bookmark, and I won a bookmark. So I was really proud. And the bookmark wasn't fatal, which I was really grateful for. So another way that I travel, and this has been popular, would, and we mentioned it in the intro, would be Route 66. And I drove Route 66 for two anniversaries. One was when the mother road turned 90, 
And the second was when the song turned, I believe it was 70, so it was 70. And my feeling was that the song was outdated because I don't know if you recall the lyrics and I will read them to you, but having driven this, a lot of these places you shouldn't recommend as a travel destination. So just quickly, I will say, now you go through St. Louis, that one's a good one. Joplin, Missouri, still recovering from tornadoes. In Oklahoma City, might look pretty, you'll see, agree with that. Amarillo, don't remember. Gallup, New Mexico, don't remember. Flagstaff, great for hiking. Don't forget Winona, absolutely forget Winona. Terrible place, <laughs> I don't even remember it. Probably about, a, oh, sorry about that microphone. Kingman, Barstone, and San Bernardino, which has the first McDonald's. It has a great museum with McDonald's, but otherwise, just go. You know, get your McDonald's fix and get out. So what we did was we rewrote the song and we put in new destinations that I thought were better representative of Route 66. And so one of them, which again plays into music, was Winslow, Arizona, which is this picture. That would be Jackson Brown standing there as a statue. And this song, as you might remember, was the Eagles. And I had that song too somewhere, but I can't remember. We can all sing it. But it was about standing on the corner. Turns out that it's not quite sure if it was Jackson Brown or the Eagles, but the story goes that a car broke down or their bus broke down. They got stuck in Winslow for the day. And then the girl drove by in the Ford flatbed, but apparently she was from Flagstaff. So it's just a combination of stories. But Winslow is a very exciting place to go just to see that sculpture and then to continue on the drive to, which was also on my list, Adrian, Texas, and that's the mayor, who I think had a grilled cheese and a Pepsi, and that's the midway point, and once you're there, you have managed to drive 1,139 miles, and you have exactly 1,139 miles to go. So there's a sign right in the middle, you stay in the middle, and it's just, you're equal. You're halfway there. Some of the other places I, for rewriting this song, would be Holbrook, Arizona, Williams, Arizona, which has a zip line, so you just zip back and forth, Pontiac, Illinois, and Springfield, Missouri, which claims to be the birthplace of Route 66. So music played another role, not as directly, but I did a bike ride, and it's on the Natchez Trace, and it's a National Park Service road, similar to Rock Creek Park, and it goes from Nashville to Natchez, Mississippi. It's 444 miles long. I did it all by myself. I learned a lot about myself. I learned that I can persevere. I can push through physical and mental pain. And I realized I don't know the entire song. I can't sing an entire song from beginning to end. I had a lot of me time. I talked a lot to myself. There were armadillo squirrels, but no people. And I sang out loud a lot. And I ran out of songs by the time like, I got out of Tennessee. But then I went to Tupelo. And that is me standing in the Tupelo hardware store, and that X marks a spot where Gladys bought Elvis' first guitar. And so I had a lot of Elvis songs in my head for at least a little bit, because I don't know an entire Elvis song either. But then I went to Muscle Shoals, and Muscle Shoals has incredible studios where the Rolling Stones recorded uh, several songs, including Wild Horses, where Keith Richards wrote it in the bathroom, so you can sit in the bathroom like Keith Richards and just feel his vibe, whatever he felt when he was in the bathroom. And they did take the toilet seat away, so you're not really like feeling the full vibe because they thought someone would steal it, so it's an imitation toilet seat. But you do get to learn all about the music history, and one of my favorite, which I didn't realize, I was a little slow to put this together, but there is a famous song, and I won't, if y'all wanna play the song, name that song game, this is a song from 1973, and the lyrics go. Now, Muscle Shoals has got the Swampers, and they've been known to pick a song or two. Lord, they get me off so much, they pick me up when I'm feeling blue. Now, how about you? Anyone know that song? Leonard Skinner, Sweet Home Alabama. And he wrote about Muscle Shoals. I had Leonard Skinner to thank to get me all the way to Mississippi, because without him, I just would have been talking to myself in armadillos. So the next sort of copywriting material would be books. And one of my favorite authors would be Paul Theroux. And he wrote Dark Star Safari. And because of him, I realized you don't need to fly. It's really important to go overland. So for Dark Star Safari, he drove overland from Cairo all the way to Cape Town. 
I did not do that. I took a budget safari, and I flew into Zimbabwe, and we drove through Botswana and ended up in Johannesburg. And one of the adventures, and it made me feel very Paul Theroux, was that we got up close with these elephants, and the night that we saw the elephants during the day, and that night we were in a campground, and the guide had said to us, make sure you put all your food in the van or the bus because animals will come and put your shoes in your tent because little critters will use them as sleeping bags or monkeys will walk off with your shoes. And if, and a guy and I, so we were kind of nervous, we were just listening to the wild and for noises and all of a sudden we heard this noise and we looked at each other and I'm like, is that what I think it is? And he's like, I think it is. And then we listened again and it was definitely a growl and I ran to go get the guy and I'm like, there's a lion in the bushes, you need to do something, like beyond hiding my shoes. And he listened and he cocked his head and he's like, he just started laughing. And he said, that's not a lion, that's the cook snoring in the tent. <laughs> there you go. So there's my Paul Thoreau, very like, dramatic moment. Another one was we got pulled over by the cops in Botswana. We ran out of bread, so the driver tried to flag down a bread delivery truck that was passing by. And as he was, flag was flagging down the bread delivery truck, a cop was watching us and we got pulled over, which I thought was really exciting. We ended up not getting a ticket, but we didn't get bread either. So there's that adventure for Africa inspired by Dark Star Safari. For penguins, I, love, I have to admit, oh, I have five minutes. Oh. Uh, sorry, I just saw that. Okay, so penguins, I'll go fast. I do love penguins. I love penguins before March of, the, uh, March of the Penguins, which was narrated by Morgan Freeman. I've always wanted to see every species of penguin. I needed to fast track that because there are about 18 of them, so I went to the Falkland Islands. There are five species. I spent two weeks there. I saw all five species within two days. So I had 10 days to hang out with penguins. And here I am at this island where you just sit among the gentoos and they come up at you and they peck at you and they're playful and they regurgitate on you. And that was honestly, that was the most phenomenal like documentary style moment of my life when it was kind enough to like share its fish with me. So there I am giving a little like thank you pinch and there are some king penguins. So for my last one, and this is my most recent, I, um, the play Come From Away, I don't know if you've all heard about it, but it was on Broadway in 2017, and it won a Tony for Best Director, and it talks about this event in 9-11, and when they closed off the airspace, all the flights that were coming into North America had to be grounded immediately, and 38 planes landed in this little town of Gander, and Gander, it doubled, nearly doubled, doubled the population, it had about 7,000 people, 500 rooms, and this town came together to help the people, gave them shelter, gave them hugs, gave them food, drove them to Walmart to get underwear because nobody had underwear. And I went to Gander. I saw the play in Toronto, and then I went to Gander, and you realize when you, if you see the play, there are all these characters, and you meet them. They are real people, and some of them were conglomeration, I thought the word, composite, but you, I met two mayors, and one of the mayors invites you over for tea, you meet the police officer, you go around and you see all the different, that's my mom, you see all the different sites that are in the play, but one of the most memorable experiences was they screech you in. And this is in the play, and I have three minutes, I'll try and read really fast. In the play, they prepare you for what you're going to, um, oh, here it is in the play. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a freshly caught Newfoundland cod and if you want to become an honorary Newfoundlander, you'll have to give her a smooch. So this is my mom giving Todd the Cod a kiss. Because what you do is you kiss the fish, you do a shot of really cheap Jamaican rum, and then you become an honorary Newfoundlander. So I did that when I was up in Gander. And all I can say is when the play comes to town in, at the Kennedy Center, I will be in the audience applauding as an American, so grateful for what the Canadians did for us. And I will also clap as an honorary Newfoundlander really proud of my people. Thank you. Very interesting. So um, as you heard from Andrea, destinations can make great workplaces but not just for travel writers, also anthropologists. 
anthropologists travel to some of the most remote areas of the world to study cultures, languages, and behaviors. This has inspired film for almost 100 years. In 1922, Robert J. Flaherty created the silent film, Nanak of the North, a story of life and love in the actual Antarctic. This film portrayed the life of an Inuk family in the Ungava Peninsula of Northern Quebec, Canada. The Library of Congress added this film to its National Film Registry in 1989. Flaherty also directed the film titled Moana in 1926, 90 years before a recent animated film of the same name. This film portrayed the traditional life of a family in a Samoan village in the early 1920s. Anthropologists study cultures like these around the world, documenting their work with videos, photos, journal articles, and books. The late French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss described study tribes in the remote areas of the Amazon. His book, Tris Tropics, discussed his travels throughout the 1930s, sharing his experience with Amazonian people, some from previously unknown tribes. It's also this book that inspired our next speaker, John Hessler. It inspired John to study linguistics, travel around the globe, and to write about cartography and the early American archeology. span John has authored books and articles about a variety of topics, and here at the Library of Congress, he's the curator of the J.I. Kislet Collection of the Archaeology and History of the Early Americas. Let's welcome John Hessler. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate the audience and uh, the other speakers and the invitation. Um, when I was 17 years old, uh, I had a plan. This was in 1978. The plan was to take a beat up Volkswagen Rabbit, which I had purchased to drive around in, tear out all the seats except for the um, driver's seat, um, where the passenger seat was to put insulate padding down so I could put my sleeping bag down there and sleep, put all my climbing equipment into the back of the hatchback and a big cooler and a bunch of books, and live in my car. Um, this was a, a plan that I thought was sheer genius. Um, I took that car and I drove it out west. Um, for money, I had told my parents, in fact, that I had moved to Philadelphia and had a research fellowship and I needed help with rent. So in this time, my dad put checks into my bank account, not knowing that I was actually um, far away, actually here in Joshua Tree National Park, um, climbing all of the routes I possibly could. Um, I spent two and a half months there um, in 123 degree heat, um, mostly climbing between four o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning because that's the only time um, that you can escape the heat. The rocks get too hot to actually touch uh, in the afternoon. Um, but this was a brilliant plan. Uh, in the afternoon, I could sit back and um, read. And one of the books that I had with me um, was a book by the great French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. Um, this is a book that's been in several copyrighted translations. Um, Susan Sontag, the great uh, critic, called it um, the best nonfiction book written in the 20th century. It is an amazing text. Um, in it, Claude Lévi-Strauss narrates basically his travels um, through the Amazon. Um, he talks about language, he talks about linguistics, um, and he talks about exploration in a way that I had never heard before. And I'm just gonna read a couple of lines um, from it and hopefully not insult the audience by what I'm actually going to say here. He begins the book with the words, I hate traveling and explorers, um, which is an interesting irony for what we're here uh, talking about. He says, nowadays being an explorer is a trade which consists not, as one might think, in discovering hitherto unknown facts after years of study, but in covering a great many miles and assembling lantern slides or motion pictures, preferably in color, so as to fill a hall with an audience for several days in, in succession. For this audience, platitudes and commonplaces seem to have been miraculously transmuted into revelations by the sole fact that their author, instead of doing his plagiarizing at home, 
has supposedly sanctified it by covering some 20,000 miles. So Levi Strauss basically sort of tears apart the notion of travel. He then goes in to describe the fact that for an anthropologist, all the sickness, all the hardship, all the things that I just talked about, the 123 degree heat, um, are incidental to actually, and they're mere inconveniences to what travel is actually supposed to be and what scientific exploration is supposed to be. The fact that we go to these places and we suffer deprivation, that things are difficult, is only an inconvenience. What we're really there for is to really learn about the cultures that we, that we have come to visit. And when I read this so many years ago, it started me down a road um, to think about what actual cultures were, in fact, in the place where I was climbing. I came out there to be an athlete, to be a dirtbag, to live in my car, to do the things that climbers do. But after reading this book, it occurred to me that there was so much more in every landscape. And that landscape was occupied by people and languages that were spoken. And it sent me down a road to study a large language group called the Udo Aztecan language group, which is a largest group of indigenous languages in the Americas. It starts from the northern part of California, extends all the way down into Mexico. So the Nahua language, the language of the Aztecs is part of this group. Um, in the area that I'm just gonna talk a little bit about today, um, the Kaliua um, language is the, is the most important thing. Now, both of these languages, both of these groups that inhabited this desert landscape, um, this is uh, a scene in the more remote part of Joshua Tree National Park. There's a public place, and then there's the 558,000 acres that you need a wilderness permit to get to. Um, this is where these people lived. This is what they did. Um, and it sent me down a road to look at more about what is, what is in this park, what is in all of the places that we travel. So all of the places that I have been traveling since that period, whether it be in the mountains of, of, of the Alps in France, whether it is in the jungles of Guatemala, I'm always looking at the people and their effect on the landscape. Um, in the case of the, the, the area around Joshua Tree, Almost none of the languages that exist are still spoken. Um, the only thing records we have in the two languages that I just put up there in the previous slide, there's only five speakers who actually still speak the language. So we have to rely on field work. We have to rely to traveling to places to actually learn how people talk, how people manage their environment. And one of the things that is most interesting to me about travel is in fact how people use plants, how people make food, how they actually survive in their environments. And when we look at um, field work like this, one of the most stable things that we can see across cultures is the names of plants. The names of plants come through um, pretty much structured in the same way in various cultures. They become cognates in cultures that co contact each other. And so most of my travels and most of my work that I've done has been associated in some way with this question of, of ethnobotany, with this question of people's interactions with plants. Um, in a recent trip where those photos are from to Joshua Tree just a couple of weeks ago, um, I went out there to really look at, at some of the archeological effects. So when we're talking about copyright, when we're talking about this book inspiring me changing my attitude towards what I was actually doing when I traveled, um, what it did is it also made me decide that I wanted to write about these cultures. It made me decide that I wanted to create material associated with them, to actually kind of bring to life for people what these cultures were like, these places that we see all the time, and yet we forget about the indigenous cultures that existed in these places. And so in the case of the the, the Kaliua that I just showed you, um, you know, one, two of the plants that they used for food were mesquite, which are beans, and these pinion pines, which grow in the desert. Um, they're pretty much throwaway plants today. No one really does much with them, but if one looks at the archeology span of Joshua Tree, that national park, if one goes into the remoter regions of this park, you're gonna see 
occupation sites like this, which are just giant rocks that you can crawl under. And in those occupation sites, you're going to see things like this. And what these are is these are holes which have been worn in the granite by women from those tribes a century, two centuries, three centuries ago, taking those dried mesquite beans and grinding them for flour on the rock in the same place, in a cool place in the summer when those things are blooming. Um, and so we see this kind of thing. We see this kind of thing in, in, these, in these, these sites. Um, now, we also, this had led me to do a lot of work um, on ethnobotany of indigenous peoples. And as far as copyright is concerned, um, to create various websites, this is one of my um, current projects, which is basically this the Ethnobotany Lab, which is basically explores the language of ethnobotany across these large groups of cultures. Um, it's not only are we producing these types of manuscripts, it's not only me producing this, but, but some of the actual people who first contacted these people produced manuscripts, produced writings about, about ethnobotany. This is the Badianus manuscripts from the 1540s. The Library of Congress itself has collected manuscripts like this. This is a recent acquisition here at the library, which is called the Codex Quetzal Akatsin. This is an Aztec manuscript written in Nahua hieroglyphic writing. Nahua, of course, being part of the same family as the two uh, cultures that I showed earlier. This particular manuscript is filled with ethnobotanical information um, that is extremely deep, extremely important to, to what we can learn about these cultures. So we have travel, basically inspiring someone to write, inspiring someone to look um, more deeply into the languages. And, and looking at things like this, um, we can see here that this particular manuscript is actually telling us, based on these cog cognates, um, this is Nahua translated into, um, into English, that this is the hill filled with red agaves. Um, a lot of these words are cognates across this this, um, this what is called a Prudo Udo Aztecan language. So it's a cognate that all of these peoples basically share the same, the same sort of linguistics of ethnobotany. Um, there are other words on the manuscripts which do the same exact thing. Um, and we can see this time and time again. Works that aren't copyrighted, works that um, are important. This is Sagun's. A manuscript which talks about the plants of Mesoamerica. Again, referencing the same plant on, that, on the library's manuscript that I just showed you. But this has been translated many, many times into a copyrighted document. Um, so again, what we have here is we have this sort of coming together of a whole bunch of, of, of things in, in one place. And then shamelessly, um, plugging my new book um, that will be coming out in the, in the, uh, in the fall here which is really about the libraries collecting um, of those documents and those artifacts relating to the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Um, in the book, I talk a lot about Levi Strauss. And I'm just going to read one passage from the book as sort of a, a little finale here. And it begins saying, the great French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, in his masterpiece Tristro Peaks, narrates his interactions with some of the most remote and unknown indigenous cultures in the Amazon. Late in the book, he reflects on what he took to be a peculiar incident in which a tribal elder who had never glimpsed writing in any form starts to mimic the anthropologist's note-taking activities. The elder, grasping pencil and paper, draws waves and lines on a page and recites to the anthropologist what he wrote, even though he could not have possibly written down his language. Levi Strauss muses that writing is a strange invention. One might suppose that, <clears throat> that its existence an emergence could not fail to bring profound changes in the condition of human culture. The act of writing, as opposed to merely speaking, is indeed a rare and culture-changing event in human history. It is an amazing and surprisingly counterintuitive fact that even though there have been more than 6,900 spoken languages documented by scholars, and probably countless others with which we have no knowledge, only five original writing systems have evolved over the long course of time. Levi Strauss continues, reminding his readers that the possession of writing vastly increases man's ability to preserve knowledge. It can be thought of as an artificial memory, the development of which 
ought to lead to a clearer awareness of the past. And so documents, inscriptions, or paintings, written in any indigenous language, especially one that dates from the earliest history of the Americas, are precious indeed. Portals into what cultures thought important enough to write down, save, and my edition, copyright. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So as you heard from John's presentation, global cultures influence creativity in so many ways. And some of our favorite songs to sing or to dance to result from collaborations with artists and writers and musicians from across the world, which brings us to another fun trivia activity game time. What international duo collaborated to perform the salsa and world beat mashup, Hips Don't Lie? By show of hands, was it A, Shakira and Wyclef John, B, Selena Gomez <coughs> and Khaled, <coughs> C, Nicki Minaj and Sean Paul? The audience gets it right again. The answer is... A, Shakira and Wyclef John. And this song, Happier, is an upbeat pop song performed by which of the following collaborators? Marshmallow and Bastille, A. B, David Guetta and Fergie. C, Calvin Harris and Rihanna. I think we had one correct answer down in the front row. <laughs> the answer is a uh, US producer, Marshmallow, and uh, British group Bastille performed that song. So music can bring the world together, sometimes to inspire collaborations never before imagined. In the 60s and 70s, George Harrison traveled to India and collaborated with Ravi Shankar bringing traditional Indian music to the Western pop scene. Together, the unlikely duo produced 1971's Concert for Bangladesh in New York. Paul Simon and South African group Lady, <coughs> excuse me, Lady, Smith, Black Mambamba, Mam, Lady Smith Black Mambazo collaborated on Simon's 1986 album Graceland, which helped pave the way for other African acts such as Stimela, and Mahalatini and the Mild Telequeens to gain popularity among Western audiences. In 2013, Swedish producer the late Avicii collaborated with U.S. soul singer Allo Black to record the chart-topping hit Wake Me Up. And last year, Stingy, Sting and Shaggy <laughs> met up in Jamaica to record a reggae album. Our next producer, our next presenter and speaker, Shodake, has experienced firsthand how international collaboration and adventure inspires music. Shodake is a professional beatboxer, breath artist, and vocal percussionist. He currently serves as an accompanist for the John Hopkins Peabody Institute Dance Program and an accompanist and composer in residence for Townsend University's Department of Dance. He's the founding director of Embody, a festival series of vocal arts. Shodake is the Baltimore Music Ambassador for One Beat, a State Department initiative that brings together emerging artists and musical leaders from around the world to collaboratively create original works and develop a global network of civically engaged music initiatives. He also collaborates with Alash, one of the leading Tuvan throat singing ensembles, traveling the world and creating new sonic and musical languages. Shodake says that his collaboration, which wouldn't have been likely throughout the 20th century, gives him hope regarding future embodiments of music, composition, and friendship. Please welcome Shodake. Can you hear me? How's everyone?
everyone doing? All right. So I want to give a little background first before I start going through some of the slides regarding my talk today, uh, a quick background story. So as a beatboxer, I'm embedded in hip hop music and hip hop culture, right? Um, but my relationship to the essence of sampling, which is the compositional, one of the main compositional traditions of hip hop music, it's different. I don't really sample from records. I'm very much inspired by that process. But I consider what I do to be a form of embodied sampling or vocal sampling. Um, so I've had a chance to travel from here to Tuva, um, up southern Siberia, to Austria, Lithuania, working with the U.S. Embassy of Lithuania, and just so many amazing adventures all the way back to Boulder and then New York City, of course, the birthplace of hip hop. Um, but I had a really interesting opportunity to have a whole new adventure at last year in 2018. So one beat work reached out to me. They're, as she mentioned before, a musical ambassadorship cultivation program. And they said, hey, someone said that we should reach out to you because you're all about cross-pollinating and working across different musical cultures. And we have this ambassadorship program, but for our 2018 tour, we want to reimagine the Voyager Golden Record of the famed NASA Voyager satellites 1 and 2, which were launched in 1977. So I'm a big space nerd, um, and immediately I was uh, enthralled and said, yeah, let's do it. So I put her in touch with a friend of mine, uh, Heather Graham, who's an astrobiologist at NASA Goddard who I had the opportunity to have amazing conversations with before, and basically put them in the same conversation. And from there, she put us in touch with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory over at NASA. And the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they are basically the ones at NASA who preserve the legacy of the Voyager legacy and satellite mission. That's still ongoing to this very day, as a matter of fact. So with all that said, how does that connect to copyright regarding my relationship to hip hop? my cultural home of hip hop, and then of course the Voyager reimagining through one beat. So this first image here is the Voyager 2 promotional poster, which I got permission to use, by the way, of course. <laughs> the uh, copyright office was, ready. make sure you have clearance to use these images. So I was like, okay, all right, I'll do that. Um, so Voyagers 1 and 2, um, they surveyed the celestial bodies of our solar system, right? Uh, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, and then beyond. Uh, poor Pluto, I don't think it traveled to Pluto. <laughs> but went out and beyond the, uh, to the heliopause and then the heliosphere. So when I look at this image, I think, OK, so it wasn't just surveying the planets of our solar system. They were sort of sampling. Uh, images and, and uh, data and just all kinds of information um, through this solar system trajectory. Now, uh, this image here is from a poster that I uh, presented, a project I presented, Beatbox Algebra, which is basically a math and music learning construct using beatboxing to learn uh, math to sort of overcome math anxiety. <clears throat> And I want to kind of bring you into my world a little bit of what I mean by embodied sampling. So this side of the room here, when I make this sound, I want you to emulate it. Ready? OK, we'll get there. <laughs> this middle section, this is your sound. Yeah, you got the easy one. This side of the room, this is your sound. <coughs> okay, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. Give yourselves a round of applause. Let's <laughs> go forth, young Jedi practice. So 
the, these are, this is an image of the golden records, right, that are on the Voyager satellites. Basically a time capsule, um, a, an existential capsule of our existence on planet Earth. Uh, different greetings in 55 different languages um, to a potential alien civilization, which may or may not ever become cut, uh, acquired because space is so vast and different musics, uh, styles, genres, songs from different cultures from all over the world, uh, sound environments that are encapsulated, like all this stuff on this record, right? So the people who committed this included, of course, the legendary Carl Sagan, famed astronomer and science communicator, uh, Frank Drank and Ann Dryan, who was married to Carl Sagan. Um, and some of the music that are featured on the Voyager Golden Records includes pieces by Bach, a piece by Bach, um, Blind Willie Johnson, Mozart, a piece by Louis Armstrong, and some of the copyrighted material are protected by such labels as Non-Such Records, Electra Entertainment, um, Columbia, and Sony Classical. Now, for me personally, as a embodied sampler, sampler, a vocal sampler, when I see this image, this is the sound that comes to mind for me. Pretty cool, huh? It's one of my favorites. Okay, so, and also when I look at this, regarding the one-beat reimagining of this, I think of what else could potentially be on here. As a vocal sampler, I get to just take away from different genres. Like, for example, I can do hip hop. I could do soca. We're in DC, so I could do go go. Or I can even do the sound the industrial sound and texture of a helicopter. When I look at this image, I also think about how this is a construct of unification based on sampling traditions, just as much as the Voyager Golden Records are a construct of unification, like hip hop and this I think, in my opinion, are two of the greatest constructs of unification based on curatorial sampling, also based on um, musical sampling in the hip-hop tradition. This is an image of me performing at the Neuroscience of Art Conference in Salzburg. Um, this was in 2015, and as you can see here, I'm sort of extending beyond uh, what it means to be an embodied sampler. I'm playing two wine glasses and the style of playing a harp sort of, I'm making them sound like harps in a way based on the resonance of the glasses and I'm doing that as I'm beatboxing at the same time. So this is, um, again, a reference to the trajectory of the Voyager satellite going through our solar system. Uh, this was a really unique opportunity, a 175-year opportunity, because the planetary alignments were just right to create an opportunity for a very efficient journey through the solar system. Um, so this also makes me think about, based on the gravitational assists that were used by the different planets, the celestial bodies, it makes me think about a gravitational assists that exist within hip-hop based on generation gaps. So if an artist is sampling um, material from the 1960s or earlier than that, or maybe the 70s, the 80s, within the context of the 21st century, there's this gravitational assist that that is cultivated between the two different generational gaps and times. <clears throat> Again, another image of the uh, trajectory based on gravitational assists. So as I mentioned before, um, One Beat reached out in 2018. I was totally all about it. I was on board. And the thing that's different about their approach, which was rooted in curatorial sampling, embodied sampling, um, because they have 
musical representatives from South America, South Africa, from India, from Malaysia, just all over the world, all over the different continents. And they are sort of gelling and finding their ways together, right? But there were also the curators of how they reinterpreted the golden records. It wasn't just the people who weren't musicians, the musicians themselves were doing it. This is an image of me performing at the Smithsonian with uh, DJ legend Qbert. Now, when I, look at this, when I look at this image, I think about the essence of the sacred crates, which are basically the breaks, samples, the original records that were used to create hip hop, um, again, as a construct of unification. So some of the material that are on the golden records are protected by copyright by Smithsonian Folkways Recordings. And some of those songs include pieces from the Congo, from Peru, from China, from Russia, from all over the world. Now, this is an image of my lungs, a sort of a visual sample, if you will, created by Erica Hansen, an x-ray in the image of my lungs. And she created the, uh, this digital extension of trees coming out of my lungs. When I look at this image, I think of this construct I've been working with for the last several years called breath art or maybe breath music. And basically we're sampling the very oxygen that are in the space and then using it to create a new creative modality of expression rooted in the air that's in the room. Maybe like this. So this is the first volume of the one beat golden record b-sides this is planet earth again curatorial sampling away from the trajectory of the actual satellites to jupiter saturn uranus neptune and the heliopause i contributed a compositional pieces to this last volume so to all you producers out there if you wanted to sample anything that i did i can't speak for the other musicians but anything that i did on here have at it because that's what we do in hip-hop but also this is public domain in a sense this was an educational release it was um basically made available for immediate download and it was it's all free so this is it's open, you know, there, there are no copyright issues in terms of my part from that perspective. An image of the heliosphere um, beyond our solar system and our, the solar reach of our sun. A little image here of uh, Chuck Berry, of course, and Carl Sagan on the invisible turntable, a little zigga zigga there. So one of my processes in, in understanding this materially more was to sample Johnny Be Good. Now I didn't sample from the record, but when the record played in my room, I beatboxed to the song. So that's a term of reinterpretive sampling. So that's also about using copyrighted content and material to guide and inform how you approach compositional works, whether you're interpreting something new or you're interpreting something from uh, an inspirational moment, but copyrighted material can be used as breadcrumbs, not just, you know, okay, who do I need to call to clear the sample, which is also very informative, but yeah, it's about being informed in a creative way to then apply creatively later. This is me in China. Now, when I look at this image, I think back to the Golden Records and imagine maybe music of Chang Xiao, the transcendental whistling traditions of China that are embedded within folklore, but unconfirmed to ask whether or not it, it still exists. Um, what about the music of the Dogon of Mali or traditional Tuvan throat singing? And of course, there's no hip hop on the Golden Records. There is hip hop on the Golden Record besides reimagining of that legacy. So when I think of this image here with DOA, uh, second generation beatbox pioneer from New York City, 
my time in Kazil Tuva with another legend, Kongaral Ondar, one of the first to globalize Tuvan throat singing all over the world. My copyrighted material on Alash Chai. You can sample that, but let's talk about publishing by Smithsonian Folkways. My time with I and O. I think about another thing that could potentially be on a imagined Voyager 3. Fusing traditional tube and throat singing with beatboxing, which I could refer to perhaps as tube and beatboxing. Maybe it would sound like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shota Care. That was amazing for uh, sharing all those embodiments of sampling and, and sharing your gift. Um, so now we have a little bit of time for questions. If our audience, I mean, our, per our participants, our presenters, would be so kind as to come up to the stage. You've got some seats right here. And if you have a question, we do have staff members in the audience with microphones. Please be sure to get one of their attention so that we can be sure to hear your question. All right, any questions for any of our presenters here? Thank you all for coming and for the delightful presentation. That was amazing. As someone who likes to travel myself, I'm always curious as to how people feel when they come back from traveling somewhere and maybe a significant mom moment in your travels that really transformed you. Do you have any of those moments and what would you say to people about just getting out there and traveling, <laughs> encouraging that? Go from that. <laughs> Coming back is the most painful part of it, to me at least. I, I, you know, you get out to a place that's remote. You have everything you possibly could want on your back. Um, the great travel writer Bruce Chatwin said the only thing he needed to survive in the world was a notebook, $20 and a leather jacket. And to a certain extent, I, I think a lot of us who travel a lot or enjoy traveling are sort of doing it because they don't really want to grow up and they hate the sort of real world. Um, and so for me, I never want to come back. I could live in that Volkswagen for my entire life and be perfectly happy. Can I take you back off of that? Yeah, that was amazing. Um, I would say <clears throat> when you're traveling beyond the borders of your city or your state or your country or your continent, when you come back home, let those journeys and travels reinforce your conceptual travels and journeys that you're having at home because we're constantly having journeys within our own home based on what we're reading or who we invite into our homes or the, the, uh, your hometown or what have you. So I think there can be a really great constructive feedback loop between your physical travels and journeys, and then the, the little journeys that you make here at home that you may or may not take for granted. It's nice you sample your journeys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I 
took my mic off. Can you? I would sort of, well, I do, I get through, I don't want to say depressed, but it's heartbreaking to have to come back. And because I love the change of environment, I always feel like I'm, a, I, get, I don't want to say tolerant, but I just feel like I'm experiencing things, I'm learning and growing. And even the smallest thing when I'm traveling, even if it's just buying like a pack of gum, like, oh my God, that was amazing. It was like the best pack of gum ever. But I try and bring that back when I come home and there's, and to still be curious. And I think that's how I get through. We live in a great city and we're surrounded by great areas. And you just take that curiosity and listening to stories because so much of it is about hearing people's stories and how they ended up here and just sort of using your travel philosophy and applying it closer to home. But I can't wait to get out of town. Like I have my bags right there. <laughs> like I'm getting on a plane at three o'clock. Um, and it's also preparing for the next journey and knowing there's always going to be another, hopefully as long as we're here. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I was wondering in your travels, do you ever bring something from home that might be copyrightable or not that kind of helps ground you or just a, a favorite book or like a favorite songs that kind of, that you bring with you in your travels? Um, oh, you want to bring something? Honestly, no. What I'm looking for is sort of new experiences and enjoying where I'm at rather than continually thinking of home. So the answer is no. I, I have no choice. My instrument is with me everywhere I go. <laughs> um, so there are two ways of sampling within hip hop and two different uh, copyright dynamics, right? So when you're on this journey to the studio and you're in the uh, recording context, um, yeah, you want to think about, OK, if I'm sampling this, that, or the third, we need to think about clearances, getting in touch with the art, artist of the original content uh, because it's copyrighted. So that's, that's, that's a whole other thing, right? But when it's a live setting, whether you're a beatboxer or a DJ, you're just like nothing is safe in a live setting because it's more rooted in this communal experience. So um, I might be thinking about copyright based in my instrument as it goes with me everywhere I go. If I'm thinking about a potential collaboration moving forward, like the Elastic Chai album that manifested years after we were working together, but <clears throat> for the most part, it's um, it's it's more of a guide than anything else. But again, I I, I wish I could leave my instrument at home sometimes. I know myself sometimes. <laughs> for me, I just don't feel home like I'm at home anywhere. Um, even though I am based in Baltimore, like if you are. Um, I never feel as if I'm settled or home. I'm always moving somewhere. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, you know, even on my Twitter account where it's got the location, I just say on the road. I don't have any, you know, so I don't ever feel home. So I never bring anything from home because I don't even really know exactly what that means. I do have a home. I do have an address. It's on my license plate. It's on my license. Um, I do say that every year I'm supposed to update my parking permit, and they ask for two years. I'm like, no, it's just temporary. I'm just doing a year. But I have been here, as I told the Uber driver, 21 years. And so, but I do like here to sort of collect my thoughts and reflect on where I've been. I didn't buy stuff until my father encouraged me to buy stuff, so I do bring back a lot of souvenirs. I have a lot of Buddhas, and I do feel like you should label things because I don't know where they came from. Um, but I'm equally happy just to go back out and just take what I can from the road and then come back here, process it, and then go out. And I just feel like it makes us better people by doing that and more tolerant. I don't know if that answers your question. Great. Think, okay, we may have time for one last question, and then we're going to um, have to wrap up our event. Uh, I went to Yunnan uh, in 2011, and lots of the people there wear uh, costumes, you know, their uh, national costume. And I wonder whether it's 
They were told to wear them to entertain the uh, tourists, or do they wear them every day anyway? I can answer that for sure. I was in the Yunnan province as well earlier this year in January. I was doing a residency in Lijiang at Lijiang Studio. And I had a chance to sample the culture of an ethnic minority group known as the Nashi people. Um, and again, a very illuminating reality to be reminded that there are minority groups that possess their own language and uh, sort of cultural identity beyond like the more industrialized parts of China. <clears throat> they had their own traditional system of food and language and costume, but their traditional dress they wore in more festive moments, if anything. The everyday had sort of remnants. The older generations definitely, they were rocking the traditional outfits because they're still embedded in this different time and they're still holding on to it and sort of serving as advocates for that for the younger generations. The younger generations, not so much. They dressed like us, like Westerners. But in, I think, more communal moments, there was a, a more of a synthesis between the two. Great. Thank, thanks for that, for that answer. And we're going to be closing out our program for today, but I want to thank our speakers again for joining us <laughs> and for sharing their time and expertise. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'd also like to thank our audience here in the Coolidge Auditorium and those streaming on the internet. And be sure to join us again as we continue our Copyright Matters lecture series on October 30th and we're gonna focus on copyright and social justice. Thank you all. Oh, and for those who are here, if you are handed a survey, you can give them to the staff members at the back. <laughs>